The following podcast contains strong language and frank discussions of violence. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everybody. Good morning. How are you this Sunday morn? I'm fine. Uh, happy Easter. Yes. Or happy be... Passover well, to you. Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and for anyone who's Italian out there who has Italian grandparents, a beast. <laughs> I you, didn't you understand that. That's, that's how Italian people with heavy accents say Happy Easter. Oh, happy, okay. I get it. Happy East. Sure. Yeah. I understand Oppie, now. Happy East. Well, we are recording this on a Sunday morning. Uh, the episode you are about to hear, though, was recorded... Many, many moons ago. <laughs> yes. Several months ago, back when we first got the idea, hey... What if we created the worldwide phenomenon that will (laughs) later become (laughs) murder amongst friends? And the funny part is we actually did sit around and be like, what can we do to become internationally known? Rock the mic. (laughs) Rock the microphone. And this is this is what we came up with. This is what what you're listening to now. Yeah. So this was one of our success. (laughs) Yeah. You're a fan. Yeah. So I guess it worked. Um so this is one of our very early attempts. So the audio's the, a little janky. Yep, it was before we had two microphones, proper setup, all of that kind of. Well, well, not, not I proper don't know if right I would now, call this a proper setup. A little I more mean... robust of a setup <laughs> than what we had back then. Yeah. So the audio is a little, uh, a little not quite up to up to par. <laughs> Not quite up to our usual crappy audio. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> little, little more crappy. It, it's if right now we're listening to below average, we're talking like D minus oh, on, on the next it's one. It's not that. I bad. cleaned it up uh, as best I could, so it's still, uh, still definitely listenable. You will uh, enjoy this story. It is one of the the weirder ones that we've discussed. Yeah, it's a cool story. And we just missed the 100 year anniversary of the crime it took place in 1922 in march 1922 but still unsolved it's still unsolved these many moons later (laughs) but before we roll the episode there are a few things that we should mention that are happening not 100 years ago but right now yes sir hit me with the hit me with some news first thing first let's update on taylor shabiznes We've been talking about a upcoming competency hearing for her for a little while she's now. She's competent. She's just a drug addict. Well, the court agrees with you. Mm. Her examining psychiatrist or psychologists uh, found many, many things that they haven't really specified. But the overall gist was that she is competent to stand trial. Yeah, no shit. So she will face the murder charges. Good. In the decapitation death. Ugh. Of uh, Shadrock. Shadrock, who <clears throat> sounds like one of the members of the Sugar Hill Gang. Yes. So that's a <laughs> that's a cool name, though. Shadrock. Yeah. I mean, come on. Shadrock. Shadrock. So obviously, we will continue to monitor that when she gets a, a court date, pretrial motions, all of that kind of stuff. We'll be sure to. Keep I mean, our she's eye. going to jail for the rest of her life. Let's. Oh yeah. It. Yeah. If she somehow gets. <laughs> gets away on a loophole or some crazy nonsense then i don't even know what i don't even know what what yeah. at that point no she's going no, yes yeah, st- subscribe not even gonna on about apple that. or no. spotify she to find out <laughs> is going to jail yes prison yes. she's not going to jail correct right. she's going to prison yes forever and ever amen <clears throat> so we will keep our eye on wisconsin and all the business going on there Ugh. We also have an update on a case that uh, made a good amount of headlines before the pandemic started. Yeah. The case of the kidnapping of the California mom, Sherry Papini. Oh, all right. You know Obviously, what? there's a lot of stuff going on yeah. there, but there was a recent... That whole story was such bullshit. <laughs> it was such bullshit. And the fact that she p- played this scam for so long is to me unbelievable and outrageous yeah like and her ex-boyfriend was like helping her perpetrate this fraud like what the f- God, sorry i Go I, I guess I'll it's uh i guess it's an in too deep 
kind of thing and you just don't know where the where the top is anymore. No, and you bullshit! Just... She literally went to her ex-boyfriend's house and said that her husband was like beating her and stuff and can I stay here? And then she stayed there and then she was having him, she was doing all these uh, self-harming things to herself and then asking him to like harm her and stuff which he said no he said no I'm not gonna do that but at that point in time if, if somebody came to you and said this person's been harming me yeah and then you see them harming themselves yeah are you not gonna put two and two together and go mm-hmm, I don't know maybe the husband really wasn't beating the shit out of her and stuff it, it stands to reason Michael it's it's a theory it it's a very good theory <laughs> come on <laughs> it's very solid information that maybe uh should have sent off a bit of an alarm bell she's finally (laughs) what she finally admitted that this was all finally admitted right finally admitted what we all knew and here's the thing and i'm getting sweaty because here's the thing that really pissed me off about this okay when i was in fourth grade so i was what nine i I switched schools right from saint bart's (laughs) we all know and love um, to a public school, Flynn, right? And when I went to Catholic school, the school was literally around the corner from my house. I would walk there by myself from first grade. I would walk like two houses down, cut behind this lady's, uh, I'd go up this lady's stairs, go behind the yard, and it would take me to like the other side of the block, and my school was right there, basically. Yeah, this is the 80s, but what's the distance that that covers? Like It was like, it was literally like if you went from your house to the end of your street yeah. up the next street and then Over. perpendicular again okay. to to like so the, the, you'd right. be on the so, parallel yeah. street so we're talking One less street less than a mile for sure yeah oh god yeah yeah but still i was like six you yeah. know when i first started doing that anyway because i was a latchkey kid so that was a thing in the 80s which hashtag was hashtag 80s <laughs> amazing um and also terrifying, terrifying and also very dangerous yeah. but um but because flynn was in another part of Providence right I had to take a school bus which I had never even been on a bus mm. at that age unless I was with yes by, by like, yourself my grandparents right. or something going to run an errand or something so I had to wait on this corner um, for the school bus at like 6 45 or 7 o'clock in the morning like too super early. early too early to, for a child to be to by, be by myself yeah. right and the street was like it was somewhat residential but also somewhat like you have to understand rhode island at that time was a business a booming business it was a jewelry business like capital of like at least the country oh yeah and um so there were all these little tiny businesses so i'm standing on the corner and oh, I'm, I'm sweaty sorry <laughs> i gotta I stand on the corner and this lady, this like older lady, like a gram, like a grandma age type lady, but she was kind of a big woman yeah. and she comes up to me and sh- she thinks I'm her granddaughter some, somehow. Okay. And she tries to get me to go with her. Mm. Like she's like, no, you have to come with me. Like mm. your mom won't let me see you. Like uh, I'm, you're going to come with me and all this. Is she putting her hands on you too? Yeah, not in like a, not in like a grabby kind yeah. of like aggressive, forcefully way, but kind of like grabbing my arm and yeah. being. But like, she's still she's in close enough in your space. Oh my god! Yeah. And so as a kid, I guess I was like, I was in the eighties. Everybody, like the message was, everybody wants to kidnap you, everybody wants to molest you, everybody wants to ki- murder you. You all have to be vigilant and la la. Okay, kids, go outside and yeah. play. Like, that's what it was like. It so, sounded hyperbolic, but it was also true. No, it was so it true. And we, we were all on, like, high alert. But, like, yeah. it was the 80s, so we just fucking, we fucked off and did whatever right. we wanted. So, in my little brain, I, first of all, I'm, t- I'm absolutely out of my body with terror. Yep. Okay? And I start to think fast. I'm like, what can I do? I'm not, I'm like, no, I'm, I can't go with you. I'm not going to go with you. And she's, she literally said, do you like candy? Oh, God. I'll get you some candy. Now, my local little store was right on the corner, Silver Lake Variety, because I used to live in Silver Lake, right? Uh, so I'm like, yes, I like candy. I like Kit Kats. I like Hershey. I like, and I'm rattling off all these candies. And she's like, okay, I'm going to go get some candy. Stay right here. And I'm like, okay. Soon as that fucking lady turned into the store, yeah. I started banging on doors. E- terrified. Nobody, but it was early in the morning. Yeah. Nobody's letting me in, right? Of course not. Finally, this one like office type 
little business. The door like opens up. There's like a couple in there Mm -hmm. and they're looking at me like I'm crazy and I'm like you have to let me in this lady's trying to kidnap me we have to call my mom we have to call the cops so they let me and they're looking at me like I'm crazy like this kid doesn't know what she's talking about yeah of course I knew what I was talking about I was in hysterics okay cut to we call the cops we call my mom in that order I can't really remember but we we made two phone calls they called and the cops end up coming. Here's where it gets a little blurry for me because at this point, I'm out of my head, ter- terrorized, okay? I remember the cops showed up. My mom showed up like a lunatic. <laughs> like, if you think that I'm a little <laughs> titched, uh, my mom is a nutcase. So she shows up like a nutter. No, no offense if you're listening. No offense, Donna. Like, you know I love you, but somebody just tried to kidnap her kid. Yeah. So she shows up like a fucking maniac. And the cops tell my mother, the lady now is gone, right? She's right. nowhere to be found. We don't know where the fuck she went at this point. The cops tell my mom, we can't do anything because she didn't actually kidnap her and she didn't actually physically harm her. Don't right. worry about the trauma right. and the the mental state that I would be in for the rest of my life that because was, of this. That was no one's concern in the 80s. No, no one cared about kids. Kids <laughs> had on. zero fucking rights. Trauma. So That's my not a mom real thing. says to the cops, if you don't handle this, I will, I will <laughs> handle this. And they're like, well, that's a threat. And she's like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> right? So the cops leave. Now, <laughs> back in the 80s in Providence, Michael, I don't know if you're aware of this, there was a very heavy mafia presence you don't say and when i was a small small kid shout out to the crime town podcast sh- shout out to crime town um i lived in a house on webster avenue owned by raymond patriarcha senior now big shout out to the crime on, town podcast big shout out <laughs> now on pacasset avenue some of these fellas goombas they Sorry. would how dare you? <laughs> How dare you? I'll bleep that. Cut that. Cut that before Michael gets himself in big trouble. Um, they would stand around on the street because they're not working, Mike. You know, they're making money oh, another way. They're always working. They're working, but yeah. they're not they're at not a job. They're not reporting to an they're office. They're not reporting yeah. to an office. Okay. So my mom, and because we lived in the neighborhood, we knew some of these guys. One of them's name was Carlo, last name withheld, who was sort of dating one of my mom's cousins. So we go, well, not we, my mother, right. goes and tells him what happened. And he says, don't worry about it. Like, we're going to take care of it. Obviously, I didn't go to school that day because I was traumatized. Yeah. So I ended up getting dropped off at a family member's house and whatever. While well, my mom still had to then go to work well, because <laughs> money. Right. And uh, come to find out later. Yeah. A little, much later, because obviously, like I said, I was like eight, so they're not having these discussions <laughs> yeah. with me. But by listening in on adult conversations and stuff later on, apparently, the the lady yeah. who tried to take me, right. she thought the bus picked me up for school while she was in the store. Right. So she left, and I never came back to, from to school the, because right. I had stayed home. When the bus came back... Yeah. She was waiting at the bus stop for me to get off the bus. Yada, yada, yada. No one ever heard from this lady again. I don't know what happened to her. I don't know where she went. I have no idea, but this lady never bothered me again. Now, weird, weird side note to this. We had a family friend that used to babysit like a bunch of us kids. She was retired. She was like an older lady. And she'd watch me, my sister, my cousin, my other little cousin, some of the random kids in like a separate neighborhood, still in Providence, but in a slightly different area. The lady who tried to kidnap me, her daughter and granddaughter lived right next door to the lady that used to babysit us. So I think in my, because I've had plenty of years to (laughs) analyze this, okay, Nonstop. I think she would come to see her granddaughter and because she was like a, a, a loony, like yeah. the, the daughter wouldn't let her see the granddaughter because mm. clearly she's little, right. you know, a little yeah. chacquad, right? So I, she must have, maybe she saw me there and somehow yeah. imprinted like on me or whatever. And also come to find out the day before she tried to take me, she had escaped or I wouldn't say escaped, but she lived in like one of those group home places uh, like where yeah. you're not locked in, but whatever. Yeah. She stole a bike 
she from a bail. girl <laughs> the night before and like stabbed her with like a pen or something to get her bike Jeez. so that she could then <laughs> pedal away from the group home oh is that is All that right. a, is that fucking nuts and then for months i had like lucid nightmares where i would just see this lady's face and I would wake up screaming and crying like panicky, yeah. couldn't breathe in like a cold sweat. Of course, we never went to therapy and stuff like that back no. in the 80s. That wasn't a thing. Come on. So it was basically like, she's not going to, you know, you're fine. Go back to sleep kind of thing. Right. And so I've just buried that trauma. So then when I had kids, oh, they never, no. from preschool to like junior <laughs> year in high school. To yesterday. <laughs> I would drop them off. Yeah. And pick them up. They never walked or took a bus until my daughter finally begged me. We literally lived a block from her high school. Yeah. Can I please walk to school with my friends? I'm like 17. <laughs> and I was like, no. Unless you are going with a group of people and you need to text me when you leave the house. You cannot look at your phone on the way to... You cannot have your headphones in. You have to be alert and you have to text me when you get to school. Because if not, you're never walking to school again. And I, she was very good about it. But like, it, I, it terrorized me. Forever to the point where yeah. I wouldn't even let my kid walk to school with her friends. God, mom, you're so embarrassing. As like a <laughs> full-grown teenager, I was yeah. like, no, because I was so terrified that something would happen. Yeah, I mean, she's still a female in this world, yes. so. <laughs> and this lady is faking a kidnapping, yeah. <laughs> which went up my ass a country mile when I heard it because I was like, yo, lady, like I was, I thwarted a kidnapping <laughs> at like nine years old, and you're over here faking it, making your entire family like so yeah. heartbroken and worried about you and it wasn't even true <laughs> it wasn't even true what even is true what even is true mike but i can tell you what's true the trauma yeah. the trauma that i suffered for literally ever when i think about it now i still get sweaty and i was nine i'm 46 yeah. we're talking like 35 years of it's good math thank you <laughs> have a little coffee today my brain's firing all the synapses are firing today <laughs> But like it's that state education. Yeah. Well, yeah. It worked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, oh my god, I can't. I was so pissed off when I heard. First of all, the story sounded ridiculous from the beginning. Yeah. But then when she finally admitted that it was fake, I'm like, yeah, no fucking shit. Yeah. So many details never lined up. No. And, yeah. Come on, dude. N nothing she said lined up at all. Oh, they're branding you. Oh, too Spanish. Of course it's Spanish. Yeah. Let's stop throwing minorities under the bus too while we're at it. Please. Oh yeah. Yeah. If you're going to lie, can you just make it about, like, make it about white people for a change? Then I'd believe it. Then I'd go, well, maybe it did yeah. happen because, you know, serial killers and shit, they're all white. So. Well, if you want to talk about a bunch of white people, I think it's time to jump into our story for this week. Yeah. Please to enjoy the story of the Hinterkaifeck murders. Take it away. This is the story of the Hinterkaifeck murders. All right. The Hinterkaifeck was a small farm in a relatively rural area of Germany, about 43 miles north of Munich. March 31st, 1922. Six Ooh, members. Throwback. Six members of the Gruber family were killed one by one with a pickaxe. Ah, oh, that can't be a good way to go. That's painful, that I'd imagine. rough. Although it is claimed, originally believed, that the four victims in the barn that I'm about to describe all died instantly from their wounds. So six members of the Gruber family, uh, one by one. First is the father, Andreas, then his wife, Cecilia, their grown daughter, Victoria, Victoria's daughter also named Cecilia. Okay. Those four were murdered in the barn. Why were they all, okay. Why were they all in the barn at the same time? They were lured one by one by the screams of the previous victim. Oh my, that's terrifying. The final two victims included the family's maid, Maria, and the Not family's- Not the maid. And the family's baby grandson, so Cecilia's, uh, baby. sorry, Victoria's- Baby boy? Yes. No. Victoria's second child, Joseph. No. Uh, they were in their rooms in the main house. Okay. Where they were killed. Okie doke. So they were killed last. I so mean, the killer had makes to go sense. Get rid of the- Grown-ups first. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. Okay. A week after the murders, Cecilia, the granddaughter, missed school twice. Mail deliverer notices that it's starting to pile up, and somebody calls the police. 
after a week. Okay. But well, in, yeah. I but mean, in the intervening... They're not on vacation, right? Nobody's turning the lights on and off. Is well, that a thing in 1920s? Somebody uh, go by yeah. and turn the lights off and on and, you know, leave a light on, Mike, so someone thinks you're home, okay? My grandmother always taught me that. When you go out, <laughs> always leave a light on so the burglars will think that someone's home and they won't come in. Should you leave music playing and the TV on as well? So uh, you know, so they I, have have heard, I have heard that. Um, but I, I just would say, hey, Nana, if they're coming in, they're <laughs> coming in. But, you know, how those old timers are. Well, in the intervening week there, before the police are actually called, April 4th, so five days after the murder, uh, someone from town actually showed up to fix an engine of one of their heavy machines. Right. I waited around the property for an hour for Andreas or somebody to show up and tell him what to do or just to, hey, I'm here. No one showed up. Well, that's going to be unusual. But he did the repair anyway. He was on the property for four and a half hours with the dead bodies. That's dedication. Yes. And then there's this other character, <laughs> Lorenz Schlittenbauer. Okay. He had sent his son, Johan, who was 16, and his stepson, also named Joseph, but he was nine, uh, to the farm to try to contact the family. This is, again, before the police were called. Why is he sending children to do a man's job, is my question. When they came back to Lorenz, that they hadn't seen anybody, Schlittenbauer headed to the farm that same day with two other townspeople. Uh, they made their way into the barn and discovered the four bodies. I don't like this Schlittenbauer, because you don't send kids to do an adult's job, Mike. So put Schlittenbauer on my list of su Number one so far. Number one suspect. I don't trust him. Go. Mm. They found the bodies in the barn first and then went into the house and found the other two Oof. victims. Now, flashback. Okay. Six months before the murders, the previous maid, so not Maria. What the hell? <laughs> these maids, these <laughs> poor maids. Can you imagine just applying for All you're trying to do is make a living, Mike. In I'm, ju I'm here, Germany. I imagine. I'm just here offering my goods and services, and I'm wrapped up with this family? Holy hell. Okay. She quit because she believed the farm to be haunted. Oh, Lord. She had been hearing strange voices and footsteps, usually from the attic area. Keys to the tool shed mysteriously vanished. Okay. They even discovered newspapers in and around the house that they did not purchase or subscribe to. Imagine it's Schlittenbauer. He's hiding in the attic this whole time. All right, that's a different story. I think I just made that up. We should. One week before the murder, it had recently snowed, mm -hmm. and they found fresh footprints not belonging to the family leading from the tree line of the forest abutting the property to the machine room, ostensibly the barn. Right. I don't like that. And I don't like that. the door lock was broken. I don't like that. If I go outside of my home knowing that I have not been outside and there are footsteps on my deck, yo, I'm about to have a tizzy. It's not, it's not going to go well. Let's put it that way. Andreas thought it peculiar. <laughs> to uh, say the least. Yeah. Didn't really do anything about it, though. Oh. Uh, what a then, good what a good family protector. Yeah, then ended up dead. Uh, <laughs> so, and, then he, and then he gets killed. Those are the basic facts of the case. Okay. Before we get into the suspect list, I would like to share one fairly innocuous yet interesting piece of information that happened post-murders. Hit me. After the investigation had been closed, the bodies of the groupers were sent for autopsy. As was custom at the time, oh God! their heads were removed Ooh. and sent to clairvoyance in Munich No. to attempt to unearth metaphysical clues. No. Now, this may shock you. <laughs> Let me guess. They couldn't figure it out. The clairvoyants weren't <laughs> successful. Oh, okay. And to make matters worse. Oh, God. Lost the heads. No! <laughs> no! I'm not, it's not funny. It's not funny. But what the hell? Um, so, here's the thing, guys. Um, we couldn't figure anything out. But barring that, we've also lost the heads of an entire family. I don't know where they went. Where? How do you lose heads? 
Where, can we where, also talk where about, are the heads, Mike? Can we talk about the irony that it's clairvoyance that lost the heads? It, where, they you shouldn't lose anything. Where are <laughs> they? You know what they blamed? If you, I swear, if you say the spirits of the bodies came back to collect their heads, what? The turmoil of World War II. It just got lost in the chaos. In of the war. shuffle? Yeah. Of, uh, did they get bombed in that area oh, and oh. the heads, you know, they're decimated because how do you misplace six? Six heads? Six, yeah. They're not in the cupboard or something. Like, where do you even keep heads? There first was of all? there was a big battalion of clairvoyance in in Germany. <laughs> so they had other you know other things. They going couldn't on. call upon their peers <laughs> and put their minds together to figure out where these heads are. Oh my god! Evidently not. Moving on to the suspects. Okay. On the night of the crime. So before you know, three days before the bodies were discovered. Yeah. One of the people that Schlittenbauer uh, took with him, Michael Plockel happened to pass by this was earlier uh, okay um, these are the days when people just used to wander yeah. aimlessly around the towns he observed that the oven had been heated by someone and that a person had approached him with a lantern and blinded him okay <laughs> whereupon that person hastily continued on their way Plocko also noticed that the smoke from the fireplace had a disgusting smell from the home, so he's just, he's just traipsing by the home, yeah. minding his own, so he says, ostensibly, and he notices that there's not only a stinky fire, yeah. but a, a weird guy with a la- Ichabod Crane came out, <laughs> blinded him with a lantern. You, John Cena, him. You can't see me. You can't see me. And then dipped. Uh, yeah. Okay. He did report it. It was not investigation. Not investigated, rather. And there were no investigations into what may have been burned in the oven that caused that smell. I mean, I get... Well, (laughs) I'll leave that out. I'm not going to make any comparisons to Germany and stinky ovens at this point (laughs) in time. At this juncture. Let's leave it where it lies. Also keeping in mind that this Plocko was one of the people to then later discover the bodies with Schlittenbauer. Right. So... You know, you know just that happens. Trapes it by, tell the cops, they do nothing, big shock, and we go on about our business down the suspect list. Okay. First actually investigated suspect. Okay. Carl Gabriel. Supposedly killed in France during World War One. His body was never recovered. Oh. That's very interesting. After the murders, people who knew him wondered if he was really dead while carl was in france his wife victoria gruber yeah one of the victims the daughter the daughter daughter. yes okay uh gave birth to a son this was joseph when the son turned two rumors started to swirl in town that the boy was actually the result of a quote relationship let me guess let me guess do it incest relationship between, with the dad between victoria and her father andreas Ew, gross, gross 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 there now gross. i put this word in quotes their closeness was actually documented in court and known throughout the village what andreas had been raping victoria but both were convicted of incest okay stop stop collaborate and listen how the hell if your dad is I would imagine it was the dad pushing the daughter into the I doubt the daughter was like, hey dad, like how's it go? Like seems unlikely. Seems unlikely that the daughter is like flashing a bit of ankle skin to her dad, <laughs> trying to entice him into a romantic relationship. So how the hell? Oh, let me guess, you know, because women obviously yeah. are the root of all evil. Obviously. She gets convict well, convicted, I guess you would yeah. say, like branded. Yep incest as if she was a willing participant that seems fair yeah i'm pissed once world war ii was over german captives from one particular area were released prematurely from soviet custody claiming that they'd been sent home by a soviet officer who spoke german the same officer claimed outright to have committed the hinterkaifeck murders oh he just confessed (laughs) hey prisoners of war I murdered a family. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, let me, you know, I know life's rough right now, okay? Things seem, let, let me regale you with a little nighttime tale of how I murdered six people. Including, including 
children and a maid that had nothing to do with anything, just trying to make a living. Nighty night. Carl had previously expressed a desire to go to Russia, so people thought maybe he was pulling this off. However, what takes away the credibility is that so the captives were released later, revised their statements and claimed, nah. That never happened. No. Yeah. I, I, uh, let's knock him off the... He's not on my list of people right now. Let's right. let's knock him off the list. Next, Lorenz Schlittenbauer. Oh, boy. After his first wife died in 1918, Lorenz may have gotten together with Victoria Gabriel and been the real father of baby Joseph. Okay. So we now have three potential fathers for yep. Joseph. Actually, only two, because Carl theoretically should have been dead. Already. Right, right, because he... What did he fake his own? How hard could it have been? Like, to fake your own death now is virtually impossible. But in 1922, I feel like just grow a beard and move to another town. <laughs> and, and that's hey, it. Hey, Carl. I'm not Carl. Hey, Carl. I'm Jose. Hola. Como estas? Me llamo Jose. Like, bro. After the bodies the Grubers were discovered, Schlittenbauer started behaving suspiciously, oh. some may say. Okay. When he and the other two first showed up, they claimed to have had to break a gate to get into the barn. However, once they found the four bodies in the barn, Schlittenbauer used a key to unlock the front door to the house and went in alone. Hold on. Hold on. This what? is what I was hoping for. He <laughs> hold on. He goes there and he's like, you guys, let's break into this barn and see what's going on. And they're like, yes, man, let's, we're men, we'll break in. They bust in find the dead bodies, and he goes, ah, you know what? Oh, my gosh. I have a key to the front door. What? First of all, why wouldn't you start with the key, go into the house, go to the home where they live, knock on the door. They don't answer. You know what, guys? I have a key. Let's go in. We'll all go in together, not separate. I'm not going to go in alone because that's wicked sus. So let's go in with the key, check things out, and then head toward the barn. Why are we starting with the barn? And I also have a key? Mm, I don't like it. Also, they can't tell how long they've been dead. Murder may still be about. Why are you going anywhere by yourself? First of all, because he's sus. That's why. Don't like him. Don't like him. Put him, he's, he's risen to the cream of the crop here, Mike. He's now, at the top. Now, if you top. recall, keys have gone missing prior to the murder. That's right. Uh, but Schlittenbauer was a neighbor and potentially having the affair with Victoria, so he might have had Maybe he had a key, key and he was, sl <laughs> he was slipping in at night and yeah. slipping in to see Victoria. Even though, as far as they knew... But how would the dad... Uh, let's assume the dad... Okay, let's assume the dad is not boning his daughter. Right. Even though it has been established. In Even though it's been established. But maybe, you know, rumors yeah. swirl about. Okay. How is the family not aware that this guy might be sliding on the home base, like right under their noses? That seems unlikely. They had been experiencing footsteps, weird voices, newspapers, footprints, missing keys for six months and didn't do anything about it. So if a random person is <laughs> invited in by one person... They're not going to notice. They're not terribly... They're, they're not astute. Yeah, they're not super suspicious, evidently, of where this newspaper comes from. First of all, can you imagine how terrifying it would be? Like, you come home after a long day of work, right? And all of a sudden, there's like a glass of brandy <laughs> or something on your table, and you don't drink. Would you not freak the fuck out? Yeah, I'm leaving. Yeah, I'm, I'm by, <laughs> yeah. I'm burning the house down with everything in it. I take my dog and we jet. So even though the murderer might still be around, the two people that went with Schlittenbauer asked him, why did you go into the house by yourself? <laughs> These people have a modicum of sense, right? They're like, hey, buddy. Keeping in mind, one of them witnessed the murderer that right. night. He claimed to have been looking for his son, Joseph. So he so he's paternity ad admitted well or to he's, these two anyway. He's either admitting and or speculating that the child is his yes. at this point. No matter what is true with respect to the son, it is known that Schlittenbauer disturbed the bodies in the house, uh, which definitely had a negative effect on the investigation. Yeah, no shit. Whoa, 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 whoa,
You're touching dead bodies? Hello, psychopath. What are you doing? Bro, the smell alone. Mm -hmm. Why would you touch it? There's probably maggots. Because this was multiple days later. Come on, guy. And I don't know what the weather would have been like. It doesn't even matter. I don't even care if it's... Don't touch it. Don't touch it. As your parents never taught you... It's not yours. Don't touch it. Leave it alone. Manners. Bad touch. Bad bad touch, good touch. Ooh. For years later, people were a little suspicious of Lorenz. <laughs> you don't say. And he kept making some strange comments and doing some strange things. Well, he seems like a strange man. Now, obviously, strange is a judgment call. But let's let's go over what some of these things are. I mean, clearly been. the daughter found his strangeness oddly alluring, <laughs> apparently. In 1925, three years. Three years later. Later. He went back to the site of the farm, which had previously been demolished. Okay, so there's nothing. It's been raised down. There's nothing there. There's nope. nothing there. Okay. He also told the local school teacher that the murderer definitely would have been stymied by the frozen ground as he tried to bury the bodies in the barn. Oh. Why would you say that? Okay. Why would you know that? Did you try? Were you trying to dig in the ground to bury people? But then you just said, well, it's... This is hard work. Now, again, because he was a neighbor, he may have just known that around that time his ground was frozen. So he may have just been wildly speculating like, boy, they may, if they tried to bury him, they wouldn't have been able to because the ground, whatever. Yeah. Who uh, knows? Okay. Okay. Makes sense. The town also started circulating the rumor that Victoria had started squeezing him for money. <laughs> for Joseph being for, his son. So he, she wanted financial support. For, for baby Yosef. For him. Okay. Now... One thing that took him down the suspect list officially was that before he died in 1941, he did win several civil claims for slander against people who kept calling him a murderer, which means they couldn't prove it. That means nothing to me. It just means they couldn't prove it. Right. That means nothing. This guy is wacky. Next suspects. Okay. The Gump Brothers. Oh, Lord Jesus. As soon as April 9th. So... Nine to ten days later, Adolph Gump was listed as a suspect because of his association with an anti-communist paramilitary group. He's not a smart man. Uh, By 1951, Adolph's sister claimed on her deathbed that Adolph and their brother Anton had killed the family. Adolph died in 1944, but Anton was arrested. So the sister throws them under the bus. Deathbed confession. Oh boy. And... One so he, either she's telling the truth or she really hated her brothers. Well, one of them had already been dead for seven years. Mm-hmm. So she hated the one that was still alive. The uh, most. Yeah, apparently. Uh, but he was released after a short time in custody. And by 1954, all of the Gump lines of inquiry were dropped. Okay. Now, I, don't I mean, have... traditionally, Gumps are not that bright. So, you know, maybe I, they didn't pull it off. I don't have. Uh, last names for these people. Okay. Just the letter S as a final initial, but we've got Carl S. and Andreas S. Related? Brothers. Brothers. These bros. 1971 now. Wow. Okay. So 50 some odd years, 50 years, they so 49 years. Yeah. But it's too early for math. Okay. The police get a letter from a woman named Therese claiming that when she was 12, she saw her mom uh, visited by the mother of Carl and Andreas. Okay. Their mother seemed to admit to Teresa's mother that Carl and Andreas were the killers. So, okay. So, so this is like a third-hand story. Of this is, confession. all right, right. So my mom and your mom get together. They're having a kiki. Cup of tea, <laughs> shooting the shit. All of a sudden, one of the moms, your mom just says, you know what, Donna? <laughs> um, What's that recently? You know, my kids, they fucking killed somebody. Six somebodies, to be exact. No fucking chance that a mom is coming out and then throwing her children under the bus unless she's terrified of them. But then go to the authorities. Why are you telling your buddy that this makes no sense? And we aren't exactly sure of when Therese was 12. And also, she... So... So how... So it couldn't even have been maybe around the time. Maybe she just... Right. It could have been later. And why would she still be 
afraid of them and all that kind of stuff. So it seems unlikely. Maybe just like a childhood. Maybe she heard the story as a kid, right? And then urban legend, all that stuff. You're afraid and you thought you heard your parents say something. You know, go in the other room. The adults are talking, right? You yeah. hear something. And in your, like, 12-year-old imagination, it, like, turns into something in the rest of your life. You put them together. You put them together and you just kind of make up a story that you think that you remember. In addition to claiming that her own sons were the killers, Therese claimed that Andrea's mother said he was particularly upset that he lost his penknife. There was actually a pocket knife found in 1923 when the farm was demolished, so not during the initial Yeah, but I feel like probably everybody in the family had a pen knife at uh, that point in time. Well, this particular one couldn't be attributed to anybody. Okay. However, the former maid, the one who quit six months before the murders, was adamant uh, that she had seen that knife in the yard while she worked there. Okay. So it may not have been right. anybody's. Could it just been it something just that been was on the ground yeah. or anything? Or, hey, you know, maybe it was the person who was leaving random newspapers and jostling around the house in the middle of the night. Maybe they just dropped their pen. Meant to put it in their pocket, life. and they missed the pocket. Missed the pocket, fell down, and they went, whoop, I better get out of here. That made a little thump. Let me let me screw out. I don't, I don't buy that one. Okay, so we don't like uh, no. Teresa's story. We don't like the Gump Brothers. No. Next, we've got Peter Weber. Oh, boy, Peter Weber. He was named a suspect by a fellow named Joseph Betts. They had worked together in the winter of 1919 to 1920 as laborers, and they shared a room. According to Betts, Weber spoke of a remote farm, Hinterkaifer, (laughs) where anything was possible. (laughs) And it was paved with stones of gold and emerald. Weber knew that only one old couple lived there with their daughter and her two children. It is likely uh, he knew about the incest between Gruber and his daughter. And then Betts later testified in a hearing that Weber had suggested killing the old man to get the family's money. When Betts did not respond to the offer, Weber stopped talking about it. Yeah. I, I, so this, this is three years before the murder that this conversation's happening. That they want to go to this farm? And I don't think they would have waited three years. I think if they were hatching a plan to go get this money because they need that cash, right? They need those ducats. <laughs> I don't think they're waiting three years to commit a murder. Unless... It's, Unless Weber was looking for an accomplice, thinking he couldn't do it alone. He asked this Joseph Betts fellow who right. turned him down, basically. And he spent the remaining intervening years trying to find somebody. Accomplice. I don't think it would have been that hard. People suck. I think he would have been like, want to kill, kill a family? No? Okay, cool. Want to go kill a family? No? Okay, cool. Want to go kill a family? Yes? Let's go. Like, it's a numbers game, Mike. Eventually, someone's going to say yes. I don't think it would take three years. People so are terrible. So we don't like Peter Weber? No. Okay. Now we've got the Bickler brothers and George Siegel. Oh, what? First of all, why are these just these bands of brothers? It's like, all right, we've got these two brothers that might have done it. we got these two brothers that might have done it. This lady's saying her two kids did it. Like, what are these? After the Bickler brothers, we do have another pair of brothers. Get, get out. <laughs> Stop. (laughs) The former maid worked at the farm for about 10 months from November 1920 to September 1921. She suspected the brothers, Anton and Carl Bickler, to have committed the murders. Anton Bickler had previously helped with the potato harvest at the farm, so he would have been familiar with the layout. The maid said Anton reportedly suggested that the family should be dead. Context. Unknown. Okay. She was also insistent in her interrogation that the farm dog who barked at everyone never barked. Never at barked. Anton. This lady who this lady I, does she have a grudge against you? She well, has a lot of information, this lady. She's a bit of an odd duck herself, because most strangely she reported speaking with a stranger through her window at night. No, get the fuck out of it. This lady's nuts. The that- maid believed it was Carl Bickler who was the brother of Anton. Why would you talk to someone that you don't know outside of your window at night in the dark, cuckoo clock? Well, that is an interesting question. Yeah, isn't it, though? (laughs) It causes a few questions to be raised. Yeah, I would say. Uh, She thought that Anton and Carl Bickler would have committed the murder together with George Siegel, who had worked at Hinterkaifeck and knew of the family fortune. Supposedly, Siegel had broken into the home in November 1920, and had stolen a number of items, though he denied it. Right. He did state that he had carved the handle of the murder weapon, that pickaxe, just 
made it while he was employed there. Okay. And knew that the tool had been kept in the barn passage where it was stashed. Well, where you would keep tools. So this this lady's a wacko. I don't like her. She. I feel like she's got an axe to grind. No, <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> but I. I don't. I don't. I don't trust this lady because I'm sorry if somebody's like throwing little pebbles at my window at night and I open it up. Woo! I can't see who it is, but they're like whispering things to me through the window. I'm moving. I mean, she did quit. Or I'm checking myself into like an asylum because that seems unlikely. Well, we've also got the Thaler brothers. Okay. They were suspected because of a statement by the maid. Get out of town (laughs) with this maid. The brothers had already committed several major burglaries in the area before the crime. That doesn't make them killers. It makes them thieves. The maid said that Joseph Thaler, so many Josephs. There's so many Josephs. Could have been the one at her window at night asking her questions about the family. (sighs) But she wouldn't answer. This this window story is going on my ass a country mile. (laughs) This is ridiculous. In conversation. I think this lady just is addicted to, like, the fame of, like, Well, look at me. Oh, they're inter. Oh my God, they're interviewing me again. Stop it! Like I don't like her. I don't like this lady. Discredited. Boop. Out of here. Get out of here. In conversation, Joseph Thaler claimed to know which family member was sleeping in which room, and stated that they had a lot of money. (laughs) During their conversation, the maid noted that there was another person nearby. Oh, you you know, not talking. Just just a guy hanging out. Just hanging out in the shadows. This is this lady's nuts. According to her statement, accusing them. Yeah, according Joseph, to a lot of her statements. Joseph Thaler and this stranger, who we're now assuming is the brother, were looking at the machine house. This lady has a thing against brothers. Does this lady have brothers that maybe were sketchy when they were kids, and she's like taking it out on all these other sets of brothers? Because she seems to be wildly speculating just about brothers in the area. <laughs> hey, you know what? I was walking down the street the other day and I saw these two brothers and I think they might have been outside my window whispering things to me, but I can't tell who it is and I never looked into it or reported it until now. And what they were whispering to me Uh, escapes me. Yeah, I can't remember what they were whispering because it's horseshit. Let's move on. All right, we have one final suspect Okay. brought to you by Bill James. Oh, Billy James. And his book, The Man from the Train. Now, this book makes a lot of convincing arguments for the particular case that they're talking about. Right. The tying into this murder is, is a little, a little bit of a stretch. Suspect. So Bill James alleges that a man known as Paul Muller uh, may have been responsible for the murders. He was the only suspect in the 1897 murder of a Massachusetts family, and James believes Muller killed dozens of victims based on research of American newspaper archives that he did. But Again. this is like 30 years pr- prior. prior. Yeah. So he had to be probably in his 50s by the 1920s, or we can assume, right? Right. Because uh, he was probably in his 20s when he was... Now, the evidence that he presents in the book for the American-based stuff is mm. pretty solid. Okay. But... That doesn't mean that he right, committed in murders Germany. in Germany. Right. The Hinterkaifeck murders bear some similarities to his suspected crimes in the U.S., including the slaughter of an entire family in the isolated home, uh, use of a blunt edge. Uh, farm tool, like the pickaxe, and the apparent absence of robbery as a motive. Uh, listen, I'm not buying it. I think this guy just wanted to make a connection and sell some books. So, Muller was described as a German immigrant uh, in contemporary media, so at the time of the 1897 murders and everything, uh, might have departed the U.S. for his homeland after private investigative journalists began to notice and publicize patterns in the murders following his okay. path. Here's the thing. He's got no connection to the family. He hasn't stolen anything. He's not He's not had a personal relationship. It's not like he's the mistaken identity dad of, of little Joseph, right? So he's got no ties. He did, You're going to tell me. 30 years later, this guy's probably in his mid-50s, let's assume. He travels from America to Germany, randomly, co- what, the maid didn't have contact with him? Where's the fucking maid with this guy? Maybe... She didn't say this guy was outside her window whispering sweet nothings to her that she can't recall. Bullshit. Not buying it. He just murders an entire family for no fucking reason and then just traipses off into the wilderness. Yes. No. 
Uh, Absolutely crock of shit. Well, and this would have been 10 years later because he left the U.S. for Germany, supposedly, uh, as he was being investigated following the brazen 1912 murder of two families in a single night in Colorado Springs. And a similar family murder weeks afterwards, a few hundred miles away in neighboring Kansas. Okay, now. great. But did he steal things from those crime scenes? He just went in and murdered people for the hell of it. Yes. I and mean... the book is called The Man from the Train because he used rail lines right. to find his victims. And I mean, as, you, also as you do. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't. I mean, I'm not, I it's don't It's tenuous buy. because it's 10 years later yeah. after kind of the main spree. Right. Now, leaving the U.S. for Germany in 1912, a couple years later, you are going to run into some pretty difficult circumstances. Let's, yeah. But that also greatly opens up your opportunity to murder because I mean, people aren't really looking. Yeah, I mean, I guess. World War One's going on, so. <laughs> Listen, guys, there's a war going on. We're we don't heads. <laughs> we can't investigate. Can't murders. find the heads of this family. <laughs> you know, there's bombs dropping all around us. We know murders are happening. We don't have the manpower to investigate. I get that. I'm not buying it. So, do we want to rank the potential suspects? Yeah. Le- yeah. Fine. So we've got Paul Muller. Zero point zero percent. We've got the Thaler brothers. Negative 100%. We got the Bickler brothers and George Siegel. Both negative 100%. They're tied. We got Peter Weber. No. Who was just yucking it up with Joseph Beck saying, <laughs> hey, let's go kill a family. I Joseph don't. Joseph being like, I'm Nah, good. you know what, buddy? I gotta wash my hair tonight. I'm good. <laughs> we got brothers S, Carl and Andreas, whose no. mother ratted them out for another mother. Not a fucking chance. If my mother, first of all, Donna, if you're listening, you ever rat me out for a crime, lady, we've got problems. We got the Gump brothers? Absolutely not. No. No. We've got Carl Gabriel, the theoretical ghost husband mm, of Victoria. That seems unlikely. So we'll give him a 35% because he would have been killed in France in World War One, right? And there's no so he there's just, no year listed. He so. just literally disappeared into the mist. Yeah, so it could have been 1918. Yeah, we, we don't have, know. Exactly we don't even when, know. So when I he would have died. No, but I will put him down low on the list. But in that time, he has to make his way back to Germany from France. Nobody undetected, recognizes him at all, undetected, and then joins the Russian army <laughs> in World War Two. <laughs> No. And becomes a prison guard no. guarding German soldiers. Right, no. That he then later releases and speaks Russian to them. Right. Um, and then just slips away, murders a, f- a family, and yeah. then again slips away into the darkness. I mm-mm. Let's drop him down to 25%. And then, last on the list, Lorenz Schlittenbauer. Schlittenbauer, 500%. <laughs> this guy is a wacko. Nobody goes around making, uh, listen, you'll always rat yourself out, okay? Your conscience will somehow, you fucking shit talk out your mouth. You got diarrhea of the mouth. You just say random shits. Such no. Such as his statement of, boy, the ground would have been too frozen. Boy, the frozen. ground would have been too frozen to bury some bodies. Hey, whoops, I have this key in my pocket. Let's search the barn first. <laughs> Absolutely no. This guy is suspect a numero uno and in my opinion guilty as fuck well maybe in a couple months when march 31st 2022 rolls around on the 100 year anniversary we shall find maybe we'll answers. get some answers but take it from me this guy is guilty as hell and that is the hinter kaifek murders fuck that dude Sh- fuck you schlittenbauer <laughs> fuck you schlittenbauer how you like me now bitch all right, so thank you for sticking through that uh, recording. Sorry if the audio was a little wonky. Hopefully you uh, enjoyed the story as much as we enjoyed the story. I think and hopefully that you came through. to the same conclusion that I did because I think we all know who did it. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't the, the ghost husband that it was, faked his own death it, somehow. It was not, no. Mike. It was no. not. Definitely uh, Schlittenbauer for sure. Look. Fuck you, Schlittenbauer. I'll say it again. Fucking Schlittenbauer. Fuck you, dude. Yeah. But until next week. 
Follow us on our socials at MAF Podcast Show. We also have a YouTube channel where you can see all of our little show preview cartoons. You get to see Michael and myself in cartoon form. It's the most you can hope for ever to see me. <laughs> That's not true. I'm going to make him do it. We're going to move to video yes. podcast. We are. So for all you ladies out there. <laughs> prepare to be disappointed. Oh, shut up. Um, and you can email us, mafpodcastshow at gmail.com. Please, we'd love to get your emails. But until the next time, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.